So this is, uh, this is an installment of the open source software series uh, speaker, a lot of S's there, uh, speaker series. Um, I'm Mike Pinkerton, I'm a software engineer at Google, and I'm going to be talking about a variety of things, uh, especially encompassing the, the lessons that we learned from Mozilla, and specifically Kamina. It's sort of one of the first questions is, you know, what do I have to say? Why, why come listen to, to anything that I have to say? Um, I've done quite a bit in the open source community in the last six or seven or eight years. Um, I was an engineer at Netscape for about five years. I was on the team that uh, opened the source, opened the Netscape communicator source to the public as, as part of the Mozilla project. I was on the team that designed Zool, our cross-platform user interface language, which is what Firefox is built in. So I was, I was on that original engineering team. Um, I'm also a super reviewer as part of Mozilla, which means that I have sort of secondary level of, of review over uh, all the code that gets checked in. So I can, I can say yay or nay on uh, pretty much anything that goes into the, the entire Mozilla source base. I'm also the project lead of a little Mac browser called, the, called Camino, which is probably the main reason why you're here. Um, but what we're, gonna, what we're really going to be talking about is not necessarily so much Camino. We, there is going to be a, a good amount of Camino talk, but what I also want to highlight is a lot of the lessons that we've learned through the entire process. So starting with opening up the source from Mozilla and how that caused us to need to do Camino and what lessons we then learned from, from inter interacting with the community um, moving forward. But to, to really understand all that, to understand why we are where we are today, we have to understand how all of this got started. You know, why is there a Camino? Why is there a Firefox? Why is there even a Mozilla? So we need to go back to 1998. So if everyone sort of joins me in our way back machine, back to 1998, uh, there was really only two browsers at the time. There was Netscape Communicator and Microsoft Internet Explorer. Um, IE4 had just was either just coming out or uh, had already come out, I don't remember exactly. And they were starting to, to rapidly gain market share by undercutting Netscape's business model, which was at the time selling communicator for 30 or $40 through retail channels and giving away, uh, you know, giving away to, to academics. So the, the business model for the company as a whole was selling this product, and Microsoft was giving it away for free. So there's, you know, there's an obvious uh, consumer choice. Do I, do I pay or do I download for free? It's usually pretty obvious. So Netscape was watching its, its market share dwindle, and we realized we, we had to change the rules. There was really nothing else that we could do in terms of competing directly with Microsoft because they had vastly greater resources, they had vastly greater monetary resources, and also engineering. You know, Microsoft was in a position where they wanted, they, they, they had a target on Netscape, and they would do and spend any amount of money in order to, uh, to realize that goal. So they, they very easily could have put 500 engineers on, on Internet Explorer and just out-engineer us and just do a lot more than, than we could possibly do as a small company. You know, Netscape was a big deal, but even in 1998, it was still a relatively small company by, by today's standards. So we realized we had to change the rules. As Internet Explorer was, was slowly becoming more and more a part of the operating system with, with 98, we knew that, there was, that Microsoft was, was going down a path of no return. The more that they were building into the operating system meant that they couldn't easily pull it out later. So we wanted to go somewhere that we knew they couldn't go. And that one, one of those places was open source. We could open source our browser we could open source all of, the, all of the technologies involved, and Microsoft couldn't follow us. Because to do that, they'd lock themselves into the operating system, and they certainly weren't going to, going to open source Windows 98. So this was certainly one, one area that we could go where we knew we had a, a few steps on them before that they could, they could switch everything and catch up. The other thing that we wanted to harness was this, this great um, community of hackers and developers in the open source that would come to our rescue. They'd come flocking to, to help Netscape defeat Microsoft and 
having the code available to them would allow them to, you know, to help us fix bugs, to help us add features, to help us make the product a lot better. And again, Microsoft wouldn't be able to leverage those same resources because they wouldn't be able to open source. So we were looking at this great hacker community and we were looking at, at the, the general anti-Microsoft sentiment, which there, there is still a lot of today. Um, and we wanted to capture and harness that. So we created this project called Source 331. And the Source 331 project was to take the, the Netscape communicator source code, which was then just down to the browser for uh, logistical purposes, and release that on March 31st, 1998. And that's where the 331 comes from. So I can, I can probably stand up here and talk for about six hours just about that specific project. Um, Thankfully, a, during the time that we were doing that, there was a documentary film crew who was following us around the company. They sort of started a little bit before, and then they finished up about six to eight months later. But they made a uh, PBS documentary called Code Rush, which you can go and go to your local library and rent, or I think you can still buy it off PBS's website. So if you're, if you're interested about that period of time with taking taking the, the closed source communicator and, and moving that into the Mozilla world, that's an excellent video uh, to watch. And it's, it's still interesting to this day, even, even for a very engineering-centric crowd. Um, what, I, what I will say is that it, it was a lot of fun. It was one of, the, one of the most interesting projects I've ever been on in terms of the group coming together, realizing this is, we have to hit this date, we have to get this out, we have to do this for the community. You know, it, it became more than just us doing something to ship a product because it was, it was the birth of Mozilla. It was you know, day one of Mozilla, March 31st, 1998, and we knew that there was something bigger out there, that we were opening the door to something that, that could eventually become really, really great and also help Netscape kill Microsoft, or at least get them off our back a little bit. So we, we went and we did that, and everything was a success. 331 came and went, and we, we shipped on time, great press, all of that. Um, and then we kind of had to go back to work. So what we were doing during the time was we were working on Netscape 5. And since we had just now opened up the source for what was going to be Netscape 5, all of the people in engineering had to wear two hats. We had to wear our open source hat, where we wanted to do everything in public. We wanted to involve the community in every decision. We wanted to be upfront and honest and you know, not, not hide anything from our users, uh, from our developers. You know, design documents were in, the, were in the open. Bug system was in the open. All of our process was out there. And we wanted to, to really live in a fishbowl so that everybody could see every part of our process. So as engineers, we're adding new features to the product, we're fixing bugs, we're taking some patches from the community, like, hey, you know, this, this is actually sort of working. Um, and, and we start making some pretty good progress. So we're, we're probably a few months from, from beta of Netscape 5, and management comes to us and they say, we've got this other rendering engine that we think that we think is really good. It's really fast, it's really small, it does all of these W3C standards, XML, HTML, CSS, DOM level, whatever, you know, just all the HTML, all the W3C buzzwords. And, you know, we'd like to investigate using this for Netscape 5 because, you know, one area where Microsoft was really starting to kill us was web standards and compatibility because they had a lot more engineers than we did. So we, we, we took a look at at doing something drastic, like switching layout engines. So the engineering groups stopped what we were doing on Netscape 5 and took about two or three weeks to do a little bit of, um, you know, just a little bit of sanity checking. We, we looked through the code. We tried to, to plot out a schedule for what it would take to actually switch over the product to use this new engine. So the, the engine at the time was a grad student project gone horribly wrong. You know, it was very difficult to extend. It was very difficult to fix. It was probably meant to last no later than Netscape 1, and here we are in Netscape 5. So the fact of moving to a cleaner code base, moving to something that had been better architected, was, was something that everybody wanted. And that, that project, that new other browser, or that new other rendering engine was called the Raptor Project. And it was done by a group down in San Diego from a company that we'd purchased, and it had been rewritten 
It started in Java, or started in C++, then it was rewritten in Java, then it was ported right back to C++. So they'd done a lot of architecture and engineering and thinking about it. So it was a lot cleaner than the spaghetti mess that we had. So everyone was really excited about it. We took a lot, we, we did a lot of research on it. We said, you know, you know this is just going to take too long. We figure it's going to take a few months. We're so close to shipping beta. Let's just get beta out there, and then we'll go and we'll do it. So management said, all right, sounds good. Thank you very much. Go back, you know, go back on your merry way. And so we kept working on Netscape 5. So me on the Mac front end team and Dave Hyatt, who was on the Windows front end team, we, were just, we just kept working. You know, all, all, the, all the engineering teams just kept moving along towards, with the singular focus of Netscape 5. Then about eight weeks later, management came to us and they got us all in a room and they sat us down and they said, you know, that Raptor project thing that we asked you about that you said we didn't have time to do, well, we're going to do it and your project's dead. It's like, what do you mean your project's dead? Well, what, what we'd been working towards, Netscape 5, which we'd called Gromit, which was our code name for, uh, for that project, they came to us and they said, Gromit's dead. We're not going to do that. We're going to completely shift gears, and we're going to base everything off of this new rendering engine. Oh, OK, great. Um, you know, no engineer likes to be told that all of their work is just down the toilet. But especially no engineer likes to be told that you know, the last eight weeks, when management knew they were going to make this decision anyway, you know, why didn't they tell us eight weeks ago? But it's one thing for just us engineers, just us in the building at Netscape. OK, management made a decision. Great, big deal. You know, management, they change their mind all the time. They make these crazy decisions. That's why they're not writing code. But it's more than just us at this point. It's also the open source community. You know, the engineers, we'd been wearing our open source hats, and we'd been playing by the rules. We'd been sharing everything that, that, we, that we knew and everything we wanted to do and everything we'd been doing with this community, this growing, burgeoning community. And suddenly, management came and, with a closed door decision, said, we're not going to do any more of that. We're going to do this other thing. And they didn't bother to tell anybody in the community. They didn't let on. They didn't make any notion or you know, any, any type of communication to the open source community. And so what, what Dave Hyatt did was he went into the bug system, and he took all 200 and something of his bugs at one time, checked them all, and marked them as won't fix. And the comment was, Gromit is dead. We're doing something else. And that is how the open source community found out that we were doing this new thing, which is just, just astounding that that would be the only communication for this major project to make a major change in direction. And the only communication was a developer marking all their bugs won't fix. And so needless to say, the open source community was pretty angry with us. We lost a lot of street credit on that day. Um, there probably wasn't much of a better way to do it. I mean, there's. Given where we were, given the decision had already been made, there really weren't any good ways to tell the community, but this certainly wasn't the right way. And a lot of developers just fled because you know, they said, if, if this is how you're going to work with the open source community, we don't want anything to do with you. And we lost a tremendous amount of street credit. So where were we? Well, we no longer have Gromit. So you know, now we're, we're starting from scratch, and we no longer have a huge chunk of our open source community. All right, well, the next sort of shoe to drop was that management came to us and they said, you know before where we had multiple, um, multiple platform teams, we had a Windows team and a Mac team and a Linux team, we don't have the money to do that anymore, so you guys can either figure out how to do it in one team or we're going to do it for Windows only. And the engineers kind of looked at her, we looked at each other. And Netscape had, had a, at the time had a very rich history of being cross-platform. Basically, from day one, it was cross-platform. And we were very proud of the fact that we were able to ship on 20 platforms at the same time with every single release. And so it was ingrained in our culture to not just ship for Windows. Certainly, it was a priority at the company, because that's where all the money was. But in, in the engineering community, it was hard-grained into us to be cross-platform. So what we did was we, we came up, we, we took a step back, and we came up with a new plan. We realized that 
you know, if we were going to do this cross-platform, that we needed, we needed something new. We looked around at all the cross-platform toolkits, and there, there really wasn't anything that, that was worthwhile. But we also made the realization that there's sort of two camps when it comes to designing software. There's the people that, that have the experience doing design and HCI and you know, all, of the, all of the good user interface background. Like that's what they've gone to school for. They know uh, certain, certain technologies. Like generally they know um, web standards. They know HTML because they've, they've been doing web layout, web design. Um, you know, they're, they're good at Photoshop. They can probably write a little bit of JavaScript. So you know, that's, that's sort of one camp. Those are the people that, that know how to design software for users. And then there's the other camp, which is the programmers, the people that actually take what the designers say and implement it. And the programmers, well, they can't design to save their lives. And all they know is this magical language that converts you know, English text to bits and bytes. C++ or you know, whatever programming language. The designers don't know C++, and the people that know C++ don't know how to do design. And so there's this huge mismatch between what the designers hand over and what the programmers end up implementing. It also really takes the designers out of the process because you know, they, they're just sort of handing things over the wall and then magic happens, magic that nobody understands unless you have a CS degree and you know, 15 years of school behind you to, to make something actually show up on the screen. So the, you know, taking the two camps in, and, and they were very separated. So we wanted to, we, we wanted to reduce that gap. We wanted to, to take the abilities that these designers had, the very strong UI skills, and make it easy for them to make UIs themselves. So how do we do that? Well, we give them tools that use the, the languages and the, the skills that they already have, HTML, DOM, JavaScript, CSS, XML. And that's how Zool came about. So we were able to make a cross-platform UI language that allowed designers to actually put bits on the screen that you could interact with. So now you no longer had to, to go to UI design or UI uh, tests and show people pieces of paper and move little scraps of paper around. They could actually make real UIs that did things, and they didn't have to have 10 years of schooling to do it. Um, so it really sort of changed, changed the world. But of course, we had to build all of this. You know, it's a great idea, but now someone's actually got to code it. So in addition to building with a new layout engine, we were building on top of that a uh, UI layer, which, you know, writing from scratch. And on top of that, our marketing department told us that this new version of Netscape had to have every single feature of the old version of Netscape, plus more, because who wants to download just the same old thing? So we were making an exact copy of Netscape Communicator and adding more features while we were at it, on top of a UI layer that was being written from scratch, on top of a rendering engine that mm, barely laid out the top 100 pages, if that. Um, so needless to say, we had a lot of work ahead of us. And we certainly had, we certainly had some difficulties. So after a few years of going through this pain, you know, it, trying to involve the open source community at, at every turn, but you know, there, we didn't really get a lot of involvement because we, we sort of told them to go away earlier. We get to the point where we have to make a call and we have to ship something for the fear of completely becoming obsolete. You know, nobody would remember who Netscape was unless we actually shipped something to users. So what we ended up doing is we just took the whole ball we called it Netscape 6, and we shipped it. And that was in, I think, 2000. And it was crap. It was absolute, total, unadulterated crap. I feel, I feel terrible that my name is connected somehow with that software project, because it was just something that I wouldn't even tell my friends to use. You know, it, it's not something that was really fit for human consumption. It was just, we have to get this out, or we'll face being obsolete. So certainly, you know, we, we took our pounds in the press because we'd spent two or more years. I mean, it had been almost three years since Netscape 4 had shipped. And here we shipped this brand new thing on this great new rendering engine, and nobody wants to use it for good reason. So we went back to the drawing board, and we, 
we were actually able to spend the time that we needed to do some improvements. We were able to improve performance. We were able to improve memory consumption. We were able to spend the time to do a lot of the polish that we didn't have time for the first go around. So that was Netscape 6.1. And you know, it sort of sucked a little less. You know, it was something that, that we could almost use on a daily basis. And then 6.2 came out. And you know, it was actually usable. It was actually pretty good. You know, from, from the history of you know, starting over from scratch and the whole debacle of Netscape 6, by the time it got to 6.2, people could actually use it. And it was actually something that you would want to tell your friends that you worked on. And then it went to Netscape 7, was the next major release. And people to this day still use Netscape 7 as their browser. You know, given, given all the badness in its history, it actually turned out pretty good. Uh, so where am I? Okay. The problem that we face, though, especially on the Mac side, is that we were constrained by a lot of the infrastructure decisions that were made long, long ago on the Raptor side. And Raptor then became Gecko, which you've probably all heard of Gecko. Um, a lot of the decisions in the infrastructure of Gecko were very Windows-centric. It was designed for Windows, it was built for Windows. The fact that it could be ported to other operating systems was an afterthought. And we actually had to go and do that after we'd already decided that we were going to use this. And so through, through that and into Zool, we were constrained by a lot of the things we were able to do. We weren't really able to make it as native feeling or even as native looking as we wanted because of a lot of those very low level uh, constraints. And a bunch of us started thinking, you know, should we spend 10 years putting all of this effort into making Zool better, or should we try something else? Should we try and, you know, sh should we go in a different direction? At about that same time, Apple approached us, Apple approached Netscape, and said, you know, we're thinking about doing a new browser. Can you guys mock something up, work something up, so that maybe we can put Gecko into a Cocoa browser? I'm like, okay, sure, sounds great. So. Um, Vitter and I did a lot of work to, to take the carbon widget layer that was, in, uh, that was in Gecko at the time, port it to Cocoa, and then be able to wrap that in a browser view. And so the very beginning of that was NS Browser View. So we had something that we could stick into a Cocoa application and make just a very simple browser. And we called it NS Browser View because you know, I had every intention that Apple was going to take this and build a browser, and we were going to stick Gecko into the operating system. It was all going to be great. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, but that's another story for another day. So we had all this code to allow people to, to put Gecko into a Cocoa application. And with all of this swirl about, well, you know, how do we make Zool be, a, be really good on the Mac? We took a look, and we said, well, we've got this other thing. Why don't we just build something in Cocoa directly. Why mess with Zool at all? It's, you know, it, what Mac users really want, they want it to feel native. They want it to be fast. They want, it, they want all of their keyboard shortcuts to work right. They want the menus to work right. They want the buttons to, to look the same way as they do in all the other applications. You know, these are things that are very important to Mac users. And you know, maybe, maybe let's try something on the side. So a couple of us went off and uh, Hyatt sort of started it, and a bunch of us sort of came in, and we started doing this little Cocoa browser wrapped around Gecko. And we did it as part of mozdev.org, and not, not initially as part of Mozilla. And people in the community took notice. They said, you know, this is kind of neat, you know, because it's fast, it's native, and it's Gecko, which meant that it had all of the power and all of the rendering um, compatibility that its big brother in Netscape 7 had. So people in the community started to gravitate to this. They, they saw that we had something. You know, it, it didn't really have bookmarks. And you, know, you could go back and forth. And maybe it, had, maybe it had a bookmark bar at the time. But it certainly wasn't a full-fledged full -fledged browser. But they saw the promise. You know, they saw, these guys are going in the right direction. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow them. And so through. It was, it was Chimera at the time, Chimera 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, a, a series of very quick 
um, iterations, we got to the point where we, we had a, a sizable community following. And it wasn't too many developers. It was mostly a, just a user following. But even though it didn't do everything its big brother did, people were really attracted to it. And as part of that, we were actually able to get buy off at Netscape to work on this full time. Um, so me and uh, Simon Fraser, Chris Sari, Kathy Brady, Conrad Carlin, a few other folks, this was our job. Our job was to make a Netscape branded browser for the Mac out of this little Cocoa open source thing. And we ended up calling that Project X. At the time, so I had already moved back, to, uh, moved back to Virginia. I was still working for Netscape at the time. So I guess this was 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, we were working for AOL. The AOL had purchased Netscape. And we were working full time on Project X. We had dedicated QA. We had dedicated engineering. Uh, we were just the small little team of Mac people working on something that we finally felt really good about. After the debacle of Netscape 6, where you know, none of us, we, we all felt like we just wanted to hang up our hats and not even be software developers anymore. It was that bad. We finally felt like we were working on something that we were proud of. Like, this is going to be really great. This is going to be you know, world changing for Netscape in terms of its ability to say, look, we take the Mac community seriously. If this is what Mac users want, we're going to give it to you. So we, we created Project X, we took the Chimera open source, we did a little bit of rebranding, you know, paid Netscape developers working on it, and we were going to release it at Macworld that year, the, the January Macworld. So we printed up all these CDs, I still got 10 or 20 of them, we printed up like 500 CDs, we were gonna hand them out at Macworld. Two days before that Macworld, an AOL executive named David Gang, who we all refer to as Dr. Evil, got wind of Project X. And he was like, what's this Project X Chimera thing? I don't understand it. And it boiled down to the fact that Netscape already had a browser. It had Netscape 7, or maybe 7.1 by then. And he, as VP of marketing or whatever position he was at at the time, uh, he, didn't, he couldn't fathom how to actually market two browsers. Like, why ship this other one if you already have Netscape 7? I can't understand. No, don't do it. So he pulled the plug on us two days before Macworld. So, you know, needless to say, we were all completely devastated again because, you know, we had CDs burned and everything. We were all ready to go. And then they pulled the plug on us. So we couldn't just let this thing die. You know, we put so much work in it, we were so proud of it. We knew it was going to be something. And so we sort of on the side, a bunch of us just kept working on it. Um, you know, just day to day, we'd spend a few hours. Some of our QA people, they'd been reassigned, but they kept working on it. And we finished it up. We got it to a point where it was really stable. It was really high quality. And we called that, uh, at, at that point, Camino, we had to shift, shift the name for copyright reasons, we called it Camino 0.7. And we pushed that out the door, and that was sort of a, a last effort product of Netscape for, for, the, for the community. And people loved it. They went crazy. Um, you know, the, even if they hadn't been following the whole history, they saw this and they'd tell their friends and they'd tell two friends and so on and so on. And the word of mouth was just, was just insane. People loved this little browser. It was fast. It rendered the whole internet. Um, it was Mac native. You know, it, it did all the things that they wanted a browser to do. And so we were all very encouraged. We're like, wow, you know, we can actually do something that, that people really like. It's not, it's not another Netscape 6. We ship something people like. And they, the, one of the main reasons they liked it was the quality was so high. You know, it barely crashed. Um, you know, it, it didn't have very many problems at all because we had this very high bar um, for release. You know, we wouldn't ship it unless we were positive that it was going to, it was going to be incredible, incredible quality. So now what do we do next? All right, well, Netscape isn't around anymore to work on it. You know, none of those engineers. So we sort of have to, we have to find other people to work on it. Well, that's our community. You know, those are all, all those people who had gravitated to the project because of its ease of use and its speed and, and its growing success now started to become our open source community. And so for 0.8, we were able to, to do an entire release cycle 
entirely done through the open source community. There was no Netscape, um, you know, no assistance from any paid corporation at that point. It was done entirely by the open source community. We had QA, you know, people downloading nightly builds and testing them. We found a lot of good developers, people who are good in Cocoa, people who, are, who understood the back end of Gecko, who could help us out. Um, you know, it, it really was done entirely by the community. And it was sort of a, a big step up for us because we realized not just that people want to use this, but people want to participate in this. People want to become part of this community because we're doing the right thing. You know, they, even though they see that we, we don't have all the bells and whistles, you know, we, it's not completely done yet, but they see the promise and they see that they want to be a part of that. So after we shipped 0.8, which, was, which people loved even more than 0.7, and part of that was because the quality was even higher, we knew we had a tall order ahead of us. You know, what, what is the, the big milestone in any open source project? Well, it's, it's that magical 1.0. You know, probably 99% of open source projects get to version 0.1.2.9.7A4B, and you know, they're just stuck that way on fresh meat for the rest of their <laughs> existence. But we wanted, the, we wanted real users to, to download our software, and so we knew we had to have that magical 1.0. So if we didn't, people would just look at it and compare us to those fresh meat things and say, well, what's the guarantee this won't delete my hard drive? It's not done yet. You know, people have this barrier at 1.0 that they won't touch anything before that. So we had to get to that major milestone. And getting to that major milestone meant that we had to have a quality that was as high or higher than 0.8, which is really hard because we'd already set an incredibly high bar for, for ourselves with the previous two releases. So it came down to really just drawing a line in the sand and saying, we have to get this out. We can't just delay it until it's perfect because we know it's never going to be perfect. We're the developers, we see all the warts, the community reports the bugs every day, they see the warts. You know, we don't, we're, we're not able to take a step back and see all of, the, all of the promise of this little application. So finally we just made the call, we say, you know, at the point we get it to the quality, we're gonna fix these you know, 20 bugs and we're gonna 1.0. At the same time, we also had, um, uh, documentation group who rebranded our entire website along with 1.0. So not only was it a user release with a user-friendly um, version number, but we also switched to a, a user-friendly website. And I'll, I'll talk some more about that. And we realized, you know, we, we finally got there. We shipped 1.0, I think February of last year, um, and we did it. You know, we went from ground zero to Something that gets you know 100,000 or 200,000 downloads every little uh, dot revision that we that we release solely through this community, this community of testers, of designers, of engineers, you know, people who just download bugs and, and or download builds and file bugs, and that's their only connection to the project. Um, you know, this this little community was able to ship something that my mom and dad would use. You know, it, it wasn't this geeky project that had 200,000 preferences and, you know, you could send a secure email from the URL bar. It was something that people actually wanted to use, and we did it. So what did we learn from all of this? So this is where a lot of the Mozilla history really, uh, really plays in, in terms of, of, of everything that we learned. Certainly from the, the Gromit Raptor debacle, killing Gromit, we have to be completely open. You know, you have to be open with your open source community. Um, Eric Raymond said it best in uh, Cathedral in the Bazaar. He said, be open almost to the point of promiscuity. You know, just everything that you can possibly share, you have to let your community in on. Because you lose a tremendous amount of street credit with them if you don't. If you're going to make back, you know, backroom decisions, then you're, you're cutting them out of their ability to feel like they're part of the project. When, when people feel like they're connected to a project, then they're going to be more excited about it. They're going to evangelize it to their friends. They're going to be willing to download daily builds even though the quality from day to day isn't that great and do their normal work with them. 
you know, and then they'll, they'll go the extra mile of when they find a bug, they'll actually file it for you because they care. You know, if you can get people excited, if you can get people to, to see the promise of your application, they'll, they'll get personally involved in helping you realize that goal. And to then withhold information from them is to completely lock them out of that, uh, completely lock them out of that cycle. So they'll just say, yeah, well, you know, if you really don't want to know what I have to say, you know, I'm just going to go use something else. But you want them to be excited. You want them to evangelize. You want them to help build your community. Because the developers are all busy working. You know, you, we can't do it ourselves. We need our community. Uh, yeah. So another thing we learned through Mozilla, certainly, was your communications with your users all, it needs to be user-centric. So when Mozilla first started out, 331.98, it was specifically meant for developers. You know, Mozilla wanted to distance itself from Netscape completely, and that Mozilla provided source code. You know, all they did, their only product was source code. And if somebody wanted to build it and put a logo on it and turn that into a product, they were free to do that from the licenses, and they felt that Netscape was going to be the one doing that. So they didn't want to release any binaries to provide, so there wouldn't be any confusion. And the website, the Mozilla.org, sort of followed that same principle. It told you how to download the source, it told you how to build it, it told you know, some developer documentation, but there was absolutely no user documentation on the website. And that progressed for years and years and years. It just became more and more and more developer-centric because that was the target audience. Even after they started releasing builds, there was almost no user documentation. So somebody would go to Mozilla.org, they might find how to download one of the nightly builds or one of the, the milestone builds, and they'd have no recourse to, you know, how do I use this? How do I set preferences? How do I do anything? You know, there was, there was, no, there was no priority on building a user community. So we started out that way with Camino as well, because, well, you know, I was doing the website in my spare time, and my main goal was helping other developers contribute to the project. So our website was, was very developer-centric. It was difficult for users. You know, we, we were targeting normal users. We weren't targeting geeks. So it was very difficult for a lot of our users to, to figure out some of the ins and outs of our software. And they had, again, they had no recourse. So we, we needed a way. To, to help both developers and users become part of this community. And so I was talking about with 1.0, we rebranded re our website in order to, to make it much more user approachable. Um, I think like the first four tabs of, of the website are now completely about being a user, about getting your questions answered, about finding ways to submit feedback, uh, you know, user forums, all of that. And then the very last tab is, you know, oh, by the way, developers, if you're really interested, you can do all of this. And that shift really helped us grow our user community because now, but before, if they had a problem, you know, they'd, they, they'd, they'd have a problem, they wouldn't be able to use the product for some reason or another, and they'd have no recourse, nowhere to turn. But now we have the website, and we could probably solve their question in two minutes. And now we've turned a user that was probably going to throw Camino into the trash into somebody who's really excited about the project because you know, it was just that last 1% that they needed. And now they have it, and they're really excited. And they're going to tell two friends, and two friends, and two friends, and so on. So we've turned minus one user into a whole bunch of users just through our website, just by having the right focus on the website. Another very big lesson that we learned from Mozilla was about ownership. When we released the software through Mozilla.org, every, every module, every architectural component of the application had an owner, such that you know, one person that, that knew the software, that knew that piece of the product better than anybody else, so that if changes needed to be made to that product, to that section of the product, that person would be able to say, yes, that's a good, no, that's not. You know, I know how most of this stuff really works, so you know, this is good or, or it isn't. The problem was probably 99% of those initial module owners were Netscape employees, because you know, we were the ones working on it, we were the developers. 
And so you know, we were the ones that knew the code the best. So when that transitioned over to Mozilla.org, all of those Netscape employees became those module owners and were now working with people in the open source community directly. Well, you know, when you're working at a corporation, there's no guarantee that any particular person is motivated or interested or you know, even cares about showing up to work. People as a whole are generally lazy and they just love collecting that paycheck. If they can sit there and play solitaire all day and still get a paycheck, heck, they're gonna do that. But the problem becomes, what if that person is a module owner? Well, they don't care, you know, they probably don't even want to be a module owner, but they were given this job solely because that's the piece of code they were working on before it was open sourced. So now everything has to go through that person to fix bugs, to make architectural changes, to make any kinds of improvements or feature additions. And if that person is completely unresponsive, the whole process breaks down. It just backs up. The community in general, in general in open source communities, they tend to highly respect ownership. So if there's no owner, somebody will step up or the community itself can decide, all right, these are the right things to do because nobody else, you know, nobody else has the final say. But if there is an owner, then the community sort of takes a step back and defers all the decisions to that owner, just out of respect. This person was granted this position for a reason. You know, this is a, this is a community where, um, you know, where hard work and good work is rewarded through, you know, through, through more ownership. And so just in general, the open source community takes a step back when there is a, a, a de facto owner. And if that owner isn't doing anything, then it makes it very hard for the community to step up. They don't want to usurp that, that, you know, that, that privilege that had been bestowed upon that module owner. You know, they don't want to step on their toes. You know, they were given it for a reason, so who are we to question them? But if they're not doing anything, it puts everybody in a really bad position. So one of the most important things I think I've learned throughout this entire process is that a weak owner is worse than no owner at all. It's better not to have any ownership of a module and let the community sort it out than to put a figurehead up there who's not gonna do anything, who doesn't care, who doesn't want to be there because they're going to make it even worse than if they weren't there at all. The other thing I've learned, certainly through Camino, is that testers are your most valuable resource, hands down. When you know, I, I talked in the beginning about how we wanted to harness this great hacker community to come and fix our bugs and um, add new features and help us defeat Microsoft as, you know, through writing all this code. Those developers never came. You know, we, years and years went by and we got a few people and we generally ended up hiring them. Uh, so there weren't really all that many people in the open source community who were doing development, who are submitting patches, who are doing any kind of re-architecting. You know, those, those developers, you know, those hordes of angry hackers who hated Microsoft never showed up. And it's a variety of reasons, you know, we can, we can go into them at length, but the fact is they, they just didn't. The people that did show up, and this surprised everybody, was testers. You know, they didn't run away when we switched architectures because they didn't really care. Most of them aren't technical. You know, most of them don't have CS degrees. They don't care one rendering engine or another. They just want a browser to use. And so they didn't run screaming when we canceled Gromit and we switched to something else. They just started testing something else. Your testers are also the people that help keep you honest. They're the ones that download your nightly builds and, you know, and provide you a sanity check. All those things you checked in yesterday, do they work or do they not work? Because it's easier to find out you know, if I do a check-in today, I'd rather know tomorrow that something I broke, that something I did broke it, rather than six weeks down the road. Because in six weeks, you've got six weeks worth of possible changes that could be, you know, that, that could break things. And it's your testers who are the ones who are testing in these environments that you can't even imagine. And especially for something like a web browser, where there is an infinite number of inputs. You know, people can throw anything at a web browser and it has to be expected to either do the right thing and certainly not crash. But most developers, certainly ones working on a web browser, you, know, you only go to 
15 or 20 sites a day just in your general surfing. You know, you go to the news site you read, or the blogs that you read, or you know, some of the other just weather sites, but you don't go to that site in Pakistan that's going to crash your browser. But someone in your testing community, because they're spread throughout the entire world, they're not just in cubes next to you doing the exact same thing, they're the ones who are, who are testing in these different situations. They're the ones behind different firewalls. They're the ones who have different proxies. They're the ones on completely different operating systems with totally different software installed. And more importantly, they're the ones throwing different input at it, foreign languages, you know, websites behind security that you couldn't get to, all of these wonderful bits of information that you and your little room of testers never would have found. You know, so you know, you've, you've opened up from, from just a small, amount of, a small amount of testing to literally anybody can help you test. And those people really are the ones who are most valuable. The, the other thing that a lot of the testers I've run into are, are really good at is they're good at recognizing patterns. They don't have to have a CS background, yet they're still able to contribute um, <coughs> very good analysis of what a bug probably is. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll be able to look at the bug database and see what was checked in. They'll be able to look at some of the files that may have been modified. And just even by their file names, you know, if, if something crashes in a text field and yesterday somebody checked in something in NS text field, chances are probably good that they're related. And you don't, you know, you don't need 10 years of CS to be able to make that connection. And so it's, it's these people who have the time, who aren't just head down, fixing bugs day in and day out, who can make these types of connections, who can say, oh, this is similar to that other bug, because they have a similar stack trace. And now the developer only has to fix one thing instead of two, because the community has done that triage for them. The community has recognized the patterns that, so the, the developer doesn't have to. And that is, that is a, very, that's a very strong trait of, of a lot of QA communities, is they can see these patterns develop, and they can make a lot of very, very accurate descriptions about what is going on without actual knowledge of or understanding of what goes on under it. What's key to that is having an open bug database. If you don't have an open bug database, you've cut out a tremendous amount of information from your testers. You know, their, their main ability to make these connections or to be able to see other bugs or see what was fixed or see um, what other things may have come up in the last couple of weeks that, that could be other duplicates of this or just other manifestations of this or, or are somehow related. And if you, if you take all of that information away from them, they're just flying blind. Um, you know, you, people would file bugs and they'd go into the ether and you would have absolutely no idea as a reporter if you were right or, you know, if, uh, or, or able to make a connection to something, to, to another bug or another issue and end up saving a developer a tremendous amount of time. What am I doing here? Okay. Um, the other thing I, I didn't mention on the previous slide is that testers are also very good at reducing test cases, at making, making very small reduce test cases so that, the, again, the developer doesn't have to waste a tremendous amount of time picking through 200K of HTML on CNN.com to find why a table is off by three pixels. Um, you know, if somebody would just file a bug and say the table's off by three pixels, that's probably two weeks of work for the developer. But if someone in the community, if that's their donation, if, if that's their contribution to the project, can take a week or a week and a half and narrow, whittle all of that down to five lines of HTML and some CSS, and then give that to the developer, the developer can probably fix that in a day. You know, so that is a tremendous contribution to a project, even though it doesn't really, it, it never shows up in terms of actual written code. It is still a very, a very sizable contribution. The, the last bullet here about process is also very useful, tying back to being open. Mozilla does a, does a reasonable job of putting all of its release process into the bug system. So you can tell when bugs are going to be filed, when they've been targeted to be fixed, when they have been fixed, when they're not going to be fixed, et cetera. So everybody knows when the product is getting ready for release because they can see, okay, the, the number of bugs that we have to fix for 
Firefox 2.0, whatever, is down to four things. Because they can do that query in the bug system and directly see the developers are getting close. You, know, you don't need to talk directly to the product management. You can infer quite a bit about how the project works and how the project does its releases through the bug system. So again, if your bug system's closed, you've cut off a tremendous amount of information from your community. Because your community really cares when you're getting ready to ship. That's when, you know, that's when they want to step it up themselves. Because any bugs, you know, any bugs that they don't find are in some sense a reflection on them. If they consider them, their contribution to be testing, they want to find all the bugs. So they want to make sure they step up when you get ready to, to release. And if you don't communicate any of that, you've lost that, that huge contribution. Another major thing that we learned throughout the entire Mozilla process is you just can't please everybody. You really shouldn't even try. There are always going to be people out there who want their pet feature, who just completely disagree with everything that you're trying to do. And sometimes you just have to stay, take a step back and say, I'm sorry. You know, we, we can't make this work. What Mozilla tried to do in the beginning, because we lost so many developers at the start when we switched rendering engines or weren't very receptive to things from, from the community, when developers did start to show up, you know, we were so overjoyed, we didn't want to say anything that could possibly turn them away. We never wanted to say no. We never wanted to, to anger these people so that they'd, they'd run off again. So we always said yes. You know, someone would come to us with a feature to, to add sending mail from the URL bar, and it would be perfectly written code, you know, perfectly optimized. It was you know, rocket fast and didn't cause slowdowns anywhere else. It didn't leak. All the wonder, you know, very well architected. And we'd say, awesome, thank you for your contribution. We're going to stick it in so that you feel like you've contributed to this open source project and that you feel important. And nobody ever stopped to ask, wait a minute. Do we really want to be able to send mail from the URL bar? Probably not. And so we ended up with a product that was full of all of these weird little features, all of these weird preferences. Because all right, so we'd add this send mail from the URL bar feature. And well, we couldn't really agree or disagree on whether we wanted. So let's add a pref. So let the user decide whether or not they want to add that. So now we've added this feature that we probably don't want at all. And now we have an extra preference. So you've got you know, tons of features that just bog everything down, make the architecture more complicated, make it more difficult for, developer, for other developers to contribute, because you've got to wade through all this extra cruft. And you've also added a lot of extra cruft visibly to your user in terms of enabling and disabling all these weird little things that 99.9% .9 of them don't even understand, let alone care about. So there comes. There comes a time when you absolutely need to be able to say no to somebody. You know, it doesn't matter if the patch is perfect, if it's well architected, if it's a beautiful implementation. If it's not a feature you want, you have to be prepared to say no. You know, thank you very much, but we don't want this. And that was one of the main problems that, that Mozilla sort of still has to this day. But it's one thing that we decided very early on in Camino was going to be sort of a, you know, a guiding principle that we were going to say no more than we were going to say yes. And that's part of the, that I, I think that's a, a major reason for a lot of its success. It doesn't have all of these crazy weird features. It doesn't have 300 preferences. You know? And in addition to that, it's not just me as the owner stepping up and saying no. It's the community being able to police that and enforce that. If you can teach your community that this is important, that in order to ship something that real people can understand, we can't say yes to everything, then the community has to be self-policing. The community has to be able to, to tell itself, you know, I, I know you really want to work on this, but you should be working on this other thing instead. Because I don't have time as the lead to do that for everybody. And once, once you, you teach your community how to do that, it becomes self-sustaining. New people that come on try and do something, and they get their hands slapped, and they, they get the religion, and they understand you know, where the project is going, and what is important, and what is not important. And they then can help teach other people who come into the community. And a single person doesn't have to do it all. A single person doesn't have to do everything. All right, so where are we going for now? We released 1.1A2 about a week ago. 
which is a, you know, it's, it's got a scary long fresh meat version number on it, but it's actually really stable. It's quite good. Um, I'm using it and I generally don't update to nightly builds or anything. Um, but one of the things that it's really drove home to me is that our, our goal of perfection, of not being even a smidge worse than the last release, has given us this, this paralysis. We're afraid to ship anything because, oh my god, what if, it, what if it crashes, or what if it's a little bit slower, or what if it doesn't do everything perfectly? You know, we set this very high bar, and it's part of what's made Camino very successful, but it's, it's tied our hands behind our back. We're not able to, to get things out and release things to our user community and get that feedback and get that, that cycle of, you know, they submit us feedback, we integrate it, and we push out another build. It's sort of release early, release often, which is very, very useful in open source communities. We've lost all of that because we're so terrified of, well, you know, we've added so many new features and it's really great, but on this one website it might crash sometimes. We can't ship it. Ugh. And so we need to get out of that. We need to find a way out of that. You know, maybe doing more frequent alphas is a way to, to help build us out of that. But we really need to put 1.1 to bed and ship it. You know, it's been like a year and a half since 1.0, and we have so many new features. I mean, I, I can't even, I could probably talk for an hour on the new features that we've added to it. And they're all good things. They're not geeky things. They're things that people in our, in our community have been asking for for a very long time. So we have to find a way to ship. And I think the only way we can do that is draw a line in the sand, ship it, and move on. Move on to 1.2. So we're really trying to get 1.1 out in February or March. And then we're going to hopefully do a very quick release in 1.2 for the bigger things that we couldn't actually get to in 1.1 and just start a, a more frequent release train because this paralysis is just killing the project. Moving forward beyond that, where do we go? There's a lot of different directions. What does a 2.0 mean? You know, 1.0 was a gigantic milestone for an open source project. What is 2.0? What about leaving behind some of the older operating systems? Right now we go back to 10.3. 1.0 goes back to 10.2. You know, how many people are still on 10.2? Um, there's a lot of things that Apple's coming out with. Core animation is spectacular. Is there any, you know, maybe if we make 2.0 leopard only, we can do all of these awesome things that our users really want, that flash, that polish, that Apple style, and deliver that in such a way you know, with, a, with a really good browsing experience. You know, does supporting all of these previous operating systems tie our hands? Maybe we should think about WebKit. Top of the trunk on WebKit, really, really fast. Problem is, it still doesn't render half the web. You know, that's, one of the big, that's one of the big features of Camino is this that Mozilla power. It, it renders the web. You, know, it, you don't run into the same problems you do in Safari. I can't surf with Safari. That's the main reason I'm still doing Camino. I can't use Safari. You know? um, we also have a big question about what are we going to do moving forward with the Mozilla Foundation. The Mozilla Foundation has made it fairly clear certainly through the corporation, that all they care about is Firefox. It's all, the, it's all Firefox all the time. If you're not Firefox, you are not important. And that is pretty much the, the direct message we've received from, certainly from the corporation. There are some people within the foundation who are still very helpful to us, um, but by and large, if you're not Firefox, you know, why are you here? And so that brings up a big question of, so why are we still, why are we still tying ourselves to Mozilla if they don't care about us at all. I mean, Camino really is the redheaded stepchild of Mozilla. You know, we're trying so hard to be a good community citizen for our parents, provide all of this extra testing through, you know, through our own testing community, through our own QA community, and we get very little in return. What we do get in return is tinder boxes, use of the bug system. Um, the bug system is very important. We don't want to really fork the bugs because most of the bugs are in the rendering engine that's shared with Firefox. We want to be in the same bug system. We also want to be using their build system, their build machines, because they're inside the firewall, so we can use TalkBack. And if we, didn't, you know, if we weren't on that same system, we wouldn't be able to upload symbols. We, we think we may have a solution for that in the medium term, but nothing in the short term. So we're sort of tied to them for some process, 
but we're really not at all tied to them in terms of goals. So that's a big question for me and some of the other leads on the project is, you know, how do we how do we keep up this relationship with the Mozilla Foundation after all they've all, all they've done for us and all they haven't done for us? Um, so that's actually all I have for the talk. Um, I wanted to open up for for Q and A for about ten or fifteen minutes. I wanted to remind everybody that. Um, this is being broadcast publicly. It's being recorded for public broadcast. So please don't ask anything Google sensitive because uh, then we won't be able to do that. Um, if it's possible, if you could go up to the mic to ask the questions and make it so that I don't have to repeat it. But I will certainly repeat questions for the people on the phone if there are any. How many users do we have right now? So the question was how many users do we have? Um, we don't have a really good estimate of that. We really only have just download numbers. Um, but probably over time, over all the different versions, I would imagine we've amassed about, about a quarter of a million, maybe 200,000. That's, that's a very rough guess. Yeah? What was the name of that documentary you mentioned earlier? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't say that. Uh, the name of the documentary is called Code Rush. Rush. And it's a PBS documentary. Thanks. Sorry about that. Yeah? Could you expand on Sure, sure. Um, so certainly in WebKit's favor, it's much simpler. Like for, for new developers coming onto the Camino project or even to any Gecko project, the learning curve is tremendous. Gecko is a very complicated, very, um, very unapproachable system. And so anybody who wants to try and do any sort of development, unless they can stay at the most, the very highest level and not have to get down into any of the rendering engine stuff, you know, they, they need to learn XPCOM and all of just all of the, the crazy infrastructure. It's much easier to get your brain around. So it's much more approachable to new developers. So we think we might with sort of a switch like that, we might be able to get a lot more developers coming to our cause just because they don't have to learn all of this craziness of Gecko. Um, you know, certainly the obvious differences of, of web compatibility, which is another main reason we're, we're sticking with Gecko right now. But, you know, Apple has full-time people paid to work on this project. And so, you know, they're, they're working really hard on improving that, that compatibility. Uh, WebKit has gotten quite a bit faster. So even though, you know, Steve Jobs likes to stand up and say Safari is the fastest web browser on the Mac. I can't see why he's saying that because pretty much every user that we get feedback from says Camino feels so much faster than Safari. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. But that's, you know, that's what I hear from, from the user community. Um, but none of them are running the WebKit that is top of the trunk, that is in the open source builds right now. That hasn't shipped yet, and it's, in theory, a lot faster. So some of the speed improvements may, be, uh, may narrow that gap quite a bit. Um, but mostly, mostly it's the, the brain print. That's, that's the biggest one. Yeah, Waldemar. So how do you all deal with uh, long-standing Gecko bags, which have been around for many years and years, and somehow they're very annoying, but they never get fixed? Yeah, so the question is, how do, how do, we, how do we deal with the long-standing gecko bugs that have been there forever, like the four-digit ones and, and all of that? Um, sometimes they do get fixed. Sometimes we, we get people who are just so absolutely annoyed by them that they take it upon themselves to go and fix them. Most of the time, however, they just stay there. You know, we, we hope that people being paid by the Mozilla Corporation will, will fix them because that you know, they're, they're actually paid to work on Firefox and fix those types of bugs. And there are a couple of people at the corporation, like Josh, who are paid to do Mac stuff. So we, we, we sort of like to let Josh do a lot of that. Um, some of them also end up going away by moving to newer technologies. Like a lot of the bugs that we had in um, not being able to render some internationalization or do um, some kind of uh, different types of international layout are solved by the new, rent, the new graphics layer, Cairo, that they're putting in, because it's on top of quartz instead of carbon. So we, we get some of that for free. But there are still quite a few four-digit bugs that you know, every Mac user just shakes their head and says, yeah, this really should be better. But you know, it, it's a volunteer project, so we need somebody to, to step up and do it. Yeah? 
one reason I like the uh, Camino over Safari is it seems to support uh, Google applications better, like the chat feature and, and uh, Gmail. Right. So uh, is that different between Gecko or is that a JavaScript? The question is, uh, Camino seems to support a lot of Google applications better than WebKit. Um, a lot of it is we, we, get, we get a lot of that for free through Gecko. You know, our use of Gecko just allows us to, to just work. Um, but there is a lot of, the, there is also a, Java, a JavaScript side of it. So I think that's about all I can say in public. So Anyone else? I'm all about the crazy. Has anyone ever looked at taking the Gecko rendering engine and implementing the WebKit APIs to be able to replace WebKit with Gecko? Uh, not that I know of, but that is a really good idea. I mean, so the question was, is, has anybody taken a look at, at putting WebKit APIs on top of Gecko's embedding APIs? And the short answer is no. The longer answer is um, it's certainly something to think about moving forward. Um, but it, there hasn't really been a lot of desire. Nobody's really asked for that. You know, so it, it would be great to, to be able to put Gecko inside Safari or something hacky like that. But we, we aren't finding companies coming to, to the Mozilla Foundation and saying, you know, we want to build this, this web app, this native web app on the Mac, and it would be wonderful, but we want to use Gecko instead. Can you give us these types of APIs? You know, nobody's, nobody's really asking for it because Safari WebKit's already on the machine, and it's good enough. So people don't, you know, you don't want to take the extra download hit. You don't want to take the extra complexity, you know, bugs, you know, to some extent, you, you, you have a more open process with the bugs, but for a developer, it's also a lot more difficult because you know, you're not just working with something already present on the operating system. So I, you know, I, I, I can see how that would be useful, and we, and we sort of thought about that when WebKit first came out, but since nobody ever asked for it, it kind of dropped by the wayside. Okay, well, if nobody else has any questions, I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, certainly thank our host, Leslie Hawthorne, for the, on the Open Source Speaker Series, and have a good one.